And I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word, either your Bible, your tablet, your phone, or maybe the pew Bible in front of you, and turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. We're continuing this summer-long uh, series that I've entitled Summer of Hope. This summer, we're combing through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we're highlighting particular passages of Scripture from both of those testaments of our Bible to discover passages, words of hope for us, because this is a, a year when we're focusing on hope in the midst of what can seem like hopeless or chaotic times. We're looking at passages in the Bible that can foster, that can engender hope in God's people. Now, perhaps you're like me and that it's been your experience in your Christian walk that whenever you're going through seasons of plenty, and by that I mean you're making money. The bank account has money enough in it to pay your bills that are coming this month. Your kids are obeying, or they are maybe growing up, and they're living lives that are flourishing and doing well. You may be like me in that in those seasons, I tend to depend on God less. When things are going great. But you take the country song and you play it forwards. That's playing the country song backwards, right? Playing the country song forwards when your dog leaves, your wife leaves, everybody leaves. <laughs> That's when you tend to depend on God more. When you're walking through crisis, when you do lose the job unexpectedly. And in these times of hardship and difficulty, God refines our focus and we recognize where true hope lies. True hope lies doesn't, true hope doesn't lie in all these things that we think we have to have in our existence for prosperity or quote-unquote blessing. True hope lies in the eternal promises of God. I am doing and we're doing a series that I refer to it and call it a topositional series. We've picked this topic, hope, and we are expositing, doing expositional messages through various passages throughout the Bible. And one of the drawbacks or difficulties to overcome with this type of a series is, as I've mentioned at the beginning of this series, we don't have the context of this specific passage that we've been studying verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through a season together. So we're kind of like plopping in right in the middle of a book and pulling it out and studying it. So, uh, but this passage today, we actually have a little bit of context. If you've been with us the last two weeks. The last two weeks, Pastor Wade preached from Isaiah chapter 36, 37, and 38. If you missed those, I encourage you to go to our website or go to our YouTube page or podcast and listen to those sermons. They, they really focused on the life and the work and God's working through probably the greatest king of the kingdom of Judah's history, King Hezekiah. Now, as you get to chapter 39, which we didn't cover in those messages, you see King Hezekiah comes and he seems to make a bit of a dumb decision. He's been doing pretty well. He's been living righteously. He's been following the Lord. God has rescued Hezekiah and Judah from some potentially devastating situations. One, the kingdom of Assyria, this world superpower that has already decimated the, kingdoms to the, the kingdom to the north, the 10 tribes of Israel. They've been obliterated. They don't exist anymore. This kingdom of Assyria is knocking at the door of Judah, and they have gone village by village, city by city, kingdom by kingdom, and decimated them, and here they are about to conquer Judah, and God, by his mighty right hand, delivered Judah from certain destruction by the kingdom of Assyria. That's one thing that Nebuchadnezzar experienced, uh, excuse me, Hezekiah experienced, but the other thing Hezekiah experienced is this deliverance from certain death, illness. God saved his life, spared him from dying. Now, it seems as you get to chapter 39 that now Hezekiah has this sense of almost invincibility that, well, God's protected me here. God's rescued me there. I'm invincible. And so he lets his guard down and he makes an incredibly dumb decision in Isaiah chapter 39. How so? 
Well, some envoys, some dignitaries from the northern kingdom of Babylon, another world superpower. If you know anything about Bible uh, descriptions, Babylon is always a picture of the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of the evil one. Babylon, some dignitaries are sent by the king of Babylon, some 900 miles away, to come and pay homage to the king Hezekiah, to congratulate him on his victories and overcoming his illness, and even to bring some lavish gifts. And so these acts of flattery towards King Hezekiah cause him to melt like butter in their hands. What does he do? Well, think about it. Because of Hezekiah's hope in God, the aggressive in-your-face attack from the Assyrians was fended off. He's sent them away. But now he just lets the kingdom of Babylon in through the back door. Here, King Hezekiah is to be the ultimate protector of the people of Judah. But he gives this Babylonian entourage the royal treatment. What does he do? He shows them all around the kingdom of Judah. He takes them to his treasury. And he says, hey, guys, y'all want to see all my money? Come here and look at all my gold. Look at all my silver. Look at all my diamonds and jewels. Then he takes them to the armory, all the weapons. He says, hey, you guys want to see all the weapons we've amassed amassed in our kingdom? And I can just imagine as, as he's taking these envoys from Babylon around to the armory and to this stockpile of wealth, they're just ooing and aahing over King Hezekiah's wealth that he's amassed. Oh, king, you are so amazing. He's a little kinglet. He's nothing. They've seen massive supplies of wealth much greater than this, but they are flattering him. They are ooing and aahing over his great victories and over his preservation of life and all of his wealth. And so they're taking inventory of everything he's got. And everything he's got will eventually be carted 900 miles away to Babylon, even the gold within the temple of God. When the prophet Isaiah hears that these dignitaries from Babylon have come, he goes to the king and he asks him point blank, hey, who are these people? Look at verse 3 of chapter 39. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? From where did they come to you? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. Now, you can almost hear how Hezekiah is enamored by his own importance here. Where did they come from? Well, first of all, Isaiah, they came to see me because I'm amazing. Not only did they come to see me, they've come from a very far country, 900 miles away. Maybe you've heard of it, Babylon. That's where they've come from. And I, the king, am entertaining these dignitaries from this major world power. And they've flattered him. They've buttered him up. And by the way, this is the classic salesman technique. If you ever go buy a car, just know this is the technique that's going to be used on you. Flattery. You give your offer. They take it. They say, I'm going to have to take this to the manager. They come back. I don't know how you did it. But the manager has agreed to your offer. Flattery. That's exactly the amount they wanted you to pay for it. So they flatter him. They give him all these words. And it worked like a charm. Notice how he answered Isaiah's inquiry in verse 4 as he continues. They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. And I can almost hear Isaiah saying, you idiot. (laughs) How could you do this? How could you show Babylon all of our wealth, all of the resources of Judah, all of the army? How could you do it? You had a summit with a hostile world leader. You laid all the cards on the table that you have, but you walked away with nothing in return. I don't know if that's happened recently, but that's what happens here. I can almost imagine Isaiah saying, I think we need to have a cognitive test on his mental capacity to lead us. So this is what happens. And so the prophet tells Hezekiah, there's going to be long-lasting consequences because of this dumb decision. Look at verse 5 of chapter 39. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming 
when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs. That means they're going to be castrated in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, Isaiah is speaking prophetically here, prophetically, but this is exactly how it went down. King Hezekiah would die in 687 BC. 90 years later, in 597 BC, what Isaiah predicts to happen, happened exactly as he said. Now, what was Hezekiah's, the king's, response to Isaiah's grim prophecy about what's going to happen? Look at verse eight of how chapter 39 ends. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord you have spoken, this word about Babylon taking all of our stuff and taking our children and castrating our young men and taking them to Babylon, this word that you've spoken about what's going to happen to Judah, what does he say? It's good. What? How could he say it's good? Here's why he said it's good. For he thought, well, at least there's going to be peace and security in my days. He could give a rip about the generations that are to come. He could give a rip about all the destruction that's going to happen to Judah at the hand of Babylon. All he's worried about is his own skin. At least I'm going to be safe. At least nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to live in the lap of luxury until then. How short-sighted. How deeply flawed. What's to become of the people of God? Now, as word of Isaiah's prediction and prophecy to Hezekiah begins to spread among the people. It begins to be the headlines of the local newspaper. As they begin to hear about this prediction that their children and their grandchildren will be hauled away into exile into Babylon, that the possessions they have will be hauled away, that the walls of the city of Jerusalem that have been standing for centuries protecting them will be torn down, that the temple that has been the center place of their worship of the one true God will be raised. It is a hopeless situation. What's to become of the people of God? Think about it. Their cousins to the north, the 10 tribes of Israel, they're already obliterated from the planet. They don't exist anymore. There's only two of the 12 tribes left. The only remaining descendants of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has just been predicted they're going to be hauled away and their city is going to be destroyed. What's going to happen to the profound promises of God that through Abraham and through his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed? Well, that's how chapter 39 concludes. Pretty grim, right? The title of my sermon is The Prediction of Hope. Oh, it's a hopeless, chaotic, sad situation. You turn the page to chapter 40, right in the midst of this hopeless situation, we have this prediction of hope. And we're only going to consider the first five verses of this chapter. And really, uh, these first five verses serve as an outline for the rest of the book of Isaiah, what's going to happen and what he's going to say. So let's look in your Bible, our focal text, verse 1 through 5 of chapter 40. The Bible says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now to be clear, this prediction of hope that Isaiah prophesies here, it is not going to come through political means. This hope that he's predicting will come to the people of Judah is not going to come just because they happen to get the right king in the palace. 
It's not going to come because they passed some kind of a $9 trillion stimulus bill. It's not going to come because they raised the minimum wage. It's not going to come because the Federal Reserve freezes the interest rates so to curb inflation. None of those means brings about the hope they're looking for. The hope that the people of God are looking for is so much bigger and so much grander than any of those things. And so I want to break down for you this prediction of hope in these first five verses and what they entail for Judah and, friend, what they also entail for us. Two main points under the outline. First, number one, I want you to know that there's a message to be expressed. The message to be expressed. Verse one is actually a command. We know it's a command because the word is repeated. It's an emphatic comfort, comfort. This is the command of the prophet to the prophet and by extension to the other prophets and to the people. Think about it. Instead of God saying, I will comfort my people, the command comes to the preacher, you comfort, you comfort the people. And it's to be a continual, ongoing work of God through the mouth of the prophets, through the mouths of the preachers. Comfort. King James says, comfort ye, because it's in the plural. Comfort, comfort. As I thought about this and meditated on it, I couldn't help but think back on our, our spring study through the book of 1 Thessalonians. In chapter 4, as Paul is correcting some of the erroneous thoughts and beliefs of the church in Thessalonica about the return of Christ, they thought, well, those believers in Jesus, those disciples who have already died and they've been buried, well, they're going to miss it. So Paul corrects that thinking, and he gives some very clear, pointed teaching about the return of Jesus. He concludes chapter 4 with these words in verse 18. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. The fact of the return of Christ, that Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom, this is a message of comfort for the people of God. Friends, the, the promise of the returning Christ, the promise of Jesus' return is the most comforting thing we can speak to each other. Christ is returning. He's going to set everything that's wrong and make it right. It brings comfort in the midst of a chaotic world. Comfort, comfort. Now, what is the content of this comforting message to be given in the midst of chaos? There's really three things I'll break down here in just a moment. But those three realities, as I mentioned a moment ago, really serve as something of an outline for the rest of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is divided into two parts, chapter 1 through 39, and then chapter 40. This is the introduction to the end of the book, chapter 66. And one of the things that Isaiah will do through the course of the rest of the book is he will show and he will compare and contrast the sinfulness of the people of Judah and the righteousness and the holiness, yet the forbearance and forgiveness of God. He will hold these things up. And one of the things we'll see is that what Isaiah does is he shares with them the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. He doesn't water down the message. He doesn't candy coat the message. He tells it like it is. He sets forth the dire condition of the people of Judah. He sets forth what their situation is. And friends, that's exactly how we're called to communicate. In fact, look at this next slide. This is important. It is only when the heinous nature of sin against God is disclosed that the announcement of de deliverance can be declared. You see, unless we re recognize we need a Savior, we will not see our need for a Savior. Unless we recognize that we have sinned against a holy God, the, the sacrifice of Jesus on a cross makes no sense to us. In order for the people to comprehend any kind of an announcement of grace and peace from God, they must first be made aware of their desperate need. But did you notice that not only did God tell them what the message was to be, comfort, comfort my people, but he also told them, this is how you're supposed to give the message. He said, speak tenderly. Speak tenderly to them. Isn't that amazing? That we proclaim the message of judgment and wrath and propitiation and sacrifice of Jesus, we proclaim that message tenderly. I was reminded once again of Paul's instruction to summon the faith Timothy in this final letter he ever wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
Paul says the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. This is our demeanor. We have a message that's the whole truth, but friends, we speak it tenderly. I'm always kind of interesting, interestingly looking at the, the beginning of Romans chapter 1 into chapter 2 and chapter 3, where the inspired writer, Paul, talks about the wrath of God. The wrath of God coming upon the rank sinfulness of man. And that's a harsh message. But notice what Paul says in chapter 2 regarding the, the nature of God. He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And friends, shouldn't we emulate those same character qualities? Patience with those who are difficult. Kindness, forbearance, speaking tenderly to the city. So what is this specific message of comfort Isaiah is commanded to communicate and by extension we are commanded to communicate. Well, it's really a three-part message laid out in three pledges that God makes towards his people. And I want you to note, before we look at them individually, they're each in the past tense. They're each in the past tense. Because listen, God is outside of the construct of time and space. This watch means nothing to God. The calendar is not important to God. God sees the whole of human history, and he is the God who providentially rules over human history. And so he speaks these promises, these pledges to the people in the past tense. God will fulfill all he has pledged to do. God will accomplish all his purposes. Here's the first pledge he makes to them in the midst of chaos. They will experience peace from conflict. Now, I want you to remember, this is right after... Isaiah's just said at the end of the last verse of chapter 39, uh, you're going to all be deported to Babylon and be their slaves. He comes into chapter 40 and says, past tense, her warfare is ended. Now, the word war, warfare is just that. It's a military term. Isaiah's using it to describe conflict, hardship, oppression, difficulty. Now, would Jerusalem experience hardship in the future? Would they experience warfare in the future? Absolutely they would. At the time of this writing, the temple is still standing. At the time of this writing, the walls are still protecting them. But there's coming a time when the walls are going to be tumbling down, when the temple is going to be stone upon stone in a pile of rubble. In spite of that hardship they would endure, there's a promise. Warfare is going to be over. Warfare is ended. There is a great theocracy coming when the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Now, does faith in that message bring comfort? Absolutely it does. See, weeping may tarry for the night, but friend, joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning, and we hope in God because he will relinquish he will end all of the conflict, all of the difficulties and hardships in this life. Secondly, we see the second phrase, and that is pardon from sin. This is the message. Not only will there be peace from conflict, there will be pardon from sin. This word translated pardon here means to be regarded with satisfaction, regarded satisfactorily, or made acceptable, to look upon Favorably, It carries the idea that satisfactory punishment has been made. That it's been meted out for the sin that's been committed. Now, to be sure, the nation of Israel, the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they had accumulated a mountain of guilt before God. But the promise is your iniquity is forgiven. Your sin is pardoned. How in the world is this going to happen? How can a righteous God, a holy God, who declares, I will by no means allow the guilty to go unpunished, how can he just arbitrarily pardon their sin? Well, friends, it's not arbitrary. This is the first hint, the first intimation 
of what will become a reality 13 chapters later in Isaiah chapter 53. Why and how is God able to forgive the mountain of guilt that they have amassed and that we have amassed? Look at Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why is God able to make this pledge of pardon that their sin, their iniquity will be completely forgiven? Because friends, the sin of Judah, though it is great, and the sin of Lookout Valley Baptist Church, though it is great, it has been laid on Jesus. He's taken the punishment. And friends, that should bring us comfort in the midst of chaos. If you will just keep this reality of Christ's sacrifice for your sin to provide for you the means of pardon, the means of forgiveness, if you'll just keep this reality in the front of your thinking, it will completely change the way you approach life. You get cut off on the interstate. Instead of saying, idiot, what'd you learn how to drive? You'll say, I'm forgiven by Jesus right? This is the way it works. When we think about the chaos in our world, and we can read the headlines, and we get more and more depressed the more we read the headlines. The massive national debt of the United States of America is primarily held in China. I had a sin debt much bigger. That's been completely wiped free by the work of Jesus Christ. It changes the way you interpret life. So this brings great comfort. Instead of being like Eeyore, oh no, we're doomed. We have hope. We have hope in Christ. So we have hope because of this peace from conflict, pardon from sin. Here's the third part of this message. There is a promise of blessing. A promise of blessing. That verse concludes that she, Jerusalem, has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, when it says double, it's not talking about double the punishment or double the wrath. It's talking about double the blessing. The sin is pardoned. That's been dealt with. And from this same hand of the Lord that pours out wrath, this same hand of the Lord will pour out double the blessing. And think again about their situations. The the 10 tribes of the north, their cousins to the north, They're gone. They're on the verge of being overthrown and deported to Babylon. And we would call them anything but double blessed, right? But our view of blessing is so small, it's so short-sighted. We get a raise at work. Oh, man, I've been blessed. Hashtag blessed, right? My kids, they're obeying. They're leading productive lives. Oh, I'm just blessed. What about when you get fired from your job unexpectedly? Are you still blessed? What about when your kid gets arrested and put in prison? Are you still blessed? Yes. Because the blessing he's talking about is not these temporary things here. They're eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. And the blessing of God is double of all your sin. Now, to be sure, because of their sin, Jerusalem would experience the cup of punishment, the cup of discipline, but from that same hand would come double the blessing. God, in his mercy and in his goodness, will bring an ultimate and a final deliverance to all of their hostility and trial. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. These are the words of comfort that are to be declared. Peace, pardon, and this promise of blessing. But here's the second thing I want you to notice from this passage, and that is the Messiah to be expected. You see, these three pledges made in this message of comfort can only be accomplished by the fulfilled and coming Messiah, the coming of a conqueror, the coming of a deliverer, the coming of a savior, a long-awaited king. See, peace from conflict only comes when the prince of peace is in rule right? 
Pardon from sin only comes through the Lamb of God who's taken away the sin of the world. And this blessing, this promise of blessing only will happen when Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords reigning on his glorious throne. So this Messiah is to be expected. He's a deliverer who's coming. How do we do respond to this truth that there is a Messiah coming? Three things I want us to see from the passage. First of all, there must be an inward preparation. Inward preparation. Verse three again says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The voice crying says this, make preparation, get ready for the coming of Messiah, prepare yourselves, he's coming. And, and how is, are we to prepare ourselves? What's the metaphor he uses here? Make a, a way in the wilderness. Uh, make a thoroughfare, a highway in the desert for our God. Now, here's the thing. We are not making a way to get out. We're making a way for God to come in. Let me say that again. We're not making a way in the wilderness to get out of this jungle of difficulty we find ourselves in. We're making a way for God to come in. As a young boy growing up on a farm in central Florida, one of the things I loved to do was build forts. And I would find a tree or I'd find a clearing and a piece of property that we owned or somewhere in the woods, and I would build me a fort. What did that it consist of? We'll just scrap lumber, a few pallets nailed together, and that was my fort. Now, to get to that place where I was going to build the fort, my dad let me play with this right here. Is that amazing? A 10-year-old boy running around with a machete every day. The 70s were a different time, so... Um, but man, I would hack and I would chop and all the underbrush until I could make a clearing, a path to where that fort was going to be constructed. And in my mind, they're glorious. They were little shacks, but they were glorious. But I had to go th through the process of hacking away the underbrush and the, the dog fennels and the weeds that were preventing me from coming in. And friends, this is the same process here. It's not hacking away to get out of your mess. It's hacking away for God to come in. What does this specifically look like? What is this preparation talking about here? Well, we find the New Testament fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, in one named John the Baptist. If you remember last year when we studied 12 months in the book of Genesis, I told you this hermeneutic, this interpretive principle, what is in the Old Testament concealed is in the New Testament what? Revealed. The same way here, Isaiah 40, verse 3, Old Testament, that somewhat concealed the meeting. Here's the revelation of the meeting in, verse, in uh, the book of Matthew. Notice um, this fulfillment in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness Here's the quote, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. What was John the Baptist's primary message? Repent. He had a baptism of repentance. He preached repentance. He told them, you must repent. In fact, when the religious muckety-mucks came out to investigate to see what was going on out in the wilderness, away from everything, who's this guy, this, this guy, John the Baptist, who's causing such a ruckus in Palestine? When he sees them coming, notice what he says to them in verse 7 and 8 of Matthew 3. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Watch this. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So here's the answer to the question. How do we make a path for God to come in? One word, repent. Repent. What is Repentance. It is a recognition of our own sinfulness before a holy God and our confession to him that what we have done is sin. It is wrong. It is heinous in his sight. And repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. It's a turning from our own rule and our own lordship and turning to the surrender of the lordship of Jesus Christ. How do you prepare for God to come in? You want God to come into your life? In power and in might, repent. That's the message of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare a way for God. Repent of your sins. When should you repent? 
as soon as you recognize it's sin. Don't put it off. You want to know how to walk with the voice of the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you in your life? You want to know that? As soon as Holy Spirit brings to your consciousness, Troy, that was sin. That was a selfish thing to do. That was an unkind thing to say. Immediately respond to the voice of the Spirit. Repent. And friends, you will begin to hear His Spirit more and more. Prepare for the coming of the Messiah. There's an inward preparation of repentance. But secondly, from this text, I want us to see there's also an outward excavation. (laughs) An outward excavation. This is something that only God can do. Look at verse 4. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. This is an outward excavation accomplished only by the very power of God. Now, this verse can be somewhat confusing to us, but but it's really not that difficult. What are all these things? What are mountains and hills? What are valleys? What are uneven grounds? Well, if you've ever read a book on those people who are explorers, like maybe Lewis and Clark and their great expedition across the continental United States, you realize that a valley, a mountain, a hill, uneven ground, rough places, those are all obstacles to the goal. (laughs) They're obstacles to the destination. Each of these things are obstacles. And what the prophet is saying is this, there's not a single obstacle to Messiah coming and ruling and reigning that God is not going to level out. (laughs) He's going to remove them all. Every roadblock, every hindrance, every obstacle to the kingdom of God coming will be completely removed. What are obstacles in the way of God coming? What are obstacles in the kingdom of our God becoming the kingdom here on this earth? Well, the same obstacles that existed way back then. The obstacle of unbelief. The obstacle of skepticism. In our day, these flesh themselves out in things like moral relativism and pluralism. What is that? The belief that, well, there's more than one way. There's more than one truth. Your truth is my truth. The thought that there's uh, these alternative explanations for meaning and existence. These obstacles will be removed. They're going to be gone. In Isaiah's day, these obstacles fleshed out in things like idolatry. How did that happen? Well, if somebody didn't think that Yahweh, the God, their God, was meeting their felt needs, well, I'll just go find me some other God. I'll just go look somewhere else to have my felt needs met. And we can look down our sophisticated noses at those primitive people and think, oh, how foolish to to turn to an idol. But we do the same thing, don't we? If our specific felt needs are not being met, we turn to the idols of materialism, the idols of prestige and men's applause, idols of possessions, idol of mind-numbing entertainment. But God will remove every obstacle. God will remove every hindrance to the kingdom coming. In fact, I want you to consider the announcement of the seventh angel in Revelation chapter 11. You're probably most familiar with this from Handel's Messiah we often hear at Christmas time. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Right? That's refrain over and over again. And this is the truth. He shall reign forever and ever. Every obstacle arrayed against him will be made low. And that leads to the final thing I'd like to point out from this passage. Not only this inward preparation for the coming of Messiah, not only the outward excavation, but finally, he will come with profound revelation. He will come with profound revelation. Look at verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's revelation. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What does it mean that the glory of the Lord will be revealed? Remember, Isaiah chapter 40 is coming on the heels of the prediction in Isaiah 39 that they're going to be carted away to Babylon and held in exile. 
And so the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Here's the thing. They regarded that the glory, the manifest presence of God among his people, well, it was confined to one address, the temple. It was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was still standing. The temple was still there. But there's coming a time when that temple will be torn down stone upon stone, rock upon rock. And what he's communicating here is, listen, the manifest presence of God is not confined to an address in Palestine. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, not just to one place, but to all flesh, all the nations of the earth. You see, Jerusalem was never intended to be a cul-de-sac for the glory of God, just a dead-end road. This is where God's presence and God's glory rests. No, it was intended to be a conduit, a thoroughfare, that the glory of God would go to Jerusalem and through Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. But it turned into a cul-de-sac. And friends, this church is not to be a cul-de-sac for the glory and presence of God. I thank God by his grace that we have begun to see that these doors are to be wide open, that our pockets are to be empty, that we may see the glory of God go to every tongue and every tribe and every people, that all flesh can see the glory of our God. This is who he's called us to be and what he's called us to do. Not a cul-de-sac, but a conduit of his glory. And when we come to grips with that magnificent calling With that tremendous responsibility, it will become the ultimate priority of our lives together as a people, seeing his glory spread. We will experience temporary hiccups. We will. We will go through momentary mishaps that will be troublesome, that will be hard, that will seek to divert our attention. But friends, we keep the main thing the main thing. We can keep the goal before us. We hope in God and his coming kingdom that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed to all flesh, every kingdom, every tribe, every tongue. And it is for this glory that we live our lives because God is all about his glory. And that leads to my last thought. Being captivated by the promise of hope and the glory of Christ will result in a total upheaval of our lives. Friends, we can't function with business as usual. We must live radically for the kingdom of God. And to that end, we now lead to a time of response. Let's go to him in prayer.